scientific inquiry is all about solving problems. Well, here's a problem. Why do we drive on parkways and park on driveways anyway? Did you ever think about that? Hi, everyone, and welcome to our discussion about scientific inquiry. Today, we're going to go through some of the things that normally we would do in school, but because of all this virus things, we just don't have time to get through everything. So let's get started right away. So we're not wasting any more time than we have to here. So the first thing that we want to do is talk about physical science, right? If you remember, we discussed this a little bit the first week of school. Physical science is what we're learning this year in science. What does it mean to be in physical science? Physical science is the study of chemistry and physics. So those are the two main topics that we're going to spend the most time on this year talking about in class. For physical science, it's divided, well, the three sciences, I guess I should say, they're divided up into separate groups. There is life science. This is what you're going to spend the majority of your time studying next year in eighth grade. Life science is all about living organisms. So think about anything that's alive that could be, your exam that could be an example for you. Palm trees, um, I don't know, coral reef, uh, platypus is a good example that's right up here on the screen. Right? Things that are alive, that's life science. Something not alive, well, just think like a lump of coal or your desk or your pencil. Those are not things that are alive, so they will not be life science. The other one, oh, here you go. My picture's a platypus right there. Um, earth science. Earth science is what you spent the majority of your time in sixth grade talking about. For earth science, you talk about things that are non-living, right, that are either here on earth or the key is anywhere else in the universe, right? And that's where... Um, there are tons of things that you could talk about with Earth science, right? I always think they should just call it Earth space science because it's the study of basically of anything not alive, no matter where it is. It doesn't actually have to be here on Earth. So for an example, right, if you're talking about, let's say, a rock, right? Sure, that's Earth science because it's here on, on Earth if it is. But if it's a rock on the moon, it still counts as Earth science, which is kind of confusing. But just think of it as it's the study of non-living stuff. Maybe they should just change the name to that non-living science. Um, if you want a non-example, right, you could say the rock if you're talking about not a rock like this, but the rock like that. You know, the, this rock right here, well, that rock right there, that's earth science. This rock right here, well, this rock would be life science because, well, the rock is alive. A rock is not alive, but the rock is alive. So to kind of recap, right, um, life science, you're studying living things, right? Think like the rock, right? or maybe a platypus or something like that, right? If it's, you know, something that's not alive, like just a rock, well, then that's, you know, that's going to be um, not life science. It's going to be earth science. <clears throat> now, we come to the best of all of them, physical science. What we're doing this year in science is physical science as our main topic of study. Physical science is the study of property and the matters that matter that makes up different, you know, elements that are on the periodic table and henceforth all the other stuff that's around us. Right, so what is matter? What are its properties? And then how does it change? What different changes go on with that? That's what we're gonna be studying this year. So what's fun about it is, for an example, you could pick almost anything. Physical science is cool because you could talk about things that are alive or things that are not alive, right? How about a fire, right? Fire is great, but what is it actually made out of? What elements from the periodic table are, in, are inside of that stuff? So that's exactly what we're gonna talk about. Now. While yes, you could talk about living things and physical science, usually, unless you're talking about the molecular makeup of it, then that kind of stuff falls back into life science. So if you were to say, study, oh my gosh, this creepy little animal right here. What, you think that thing's cute? Well, let me show you another version of it. Oh, here's the, oh no, it's, no, it's definitely not cute anymore. But um, this would fall under life science. Again, unless you want to talk about, okay, what's the difference between maybe like the elements that are inside the animal's eyes compared to the hair coming out of its ear? Oh, okay, let's move on. That thing's creepy right there. Physical science would focus on like spaceships or um, things like that. that are usually non-living and everything um, like that for it. So let's try to practice with this a little bit. Are you ready? You think you're ready to do this? If I show you this picture right here, which one of the three sciences do you think it is? Probably, while you could argue different things, you know, you could argue physical science because you could talk about what elements make up the, ele the frog's skin and things like that. But in general, it's probably going to be life science because it's a living creature, right? If it was this, here's a picture of Jupiter right here. 
probably it's going to fall into earth science, right? Because remember, earth science is not just earth. It's kind of like earth space science, right? It's the study of non-living things. Right here, if I showed you this picture, probably, well, now you could kind of like debate, right? This is actually a photograph uh, from Mars. This is a rover driving around on Mars right here, taking a selfie of itself. You could say, oh, that's physical science, technological things, right? The making of uh, stuff, engineering, that's all physical science. But then the Earth scientists could claim, oh, no, that's ours. It's out in, you know, out in the universe out there and everything because it's Mars. So both of those could both claim it and everything. But what if all of a sudden later today it takes a picture like this? Then you better believe it. The life scientists are all going to be in there claiming, no, that's now ours, right? Because now there's life on Mars and everything. This picture right here, well, you could say Earth science if you're talking about, oh, okay, it's the tropics, and water and things like that. But you could also say life science if you want to talk about the fish that are swimming around in the water and all the other microscopic creatures that are in there. How about this? What happens when they come out with a new iPhone, right? What will the new iPhone look like? Who knows? But um, if they were talking about just that, it's probably easily going to be physical science, right? Remember, things that are being engineered and created and built, that's physical science usually. How about this? A flower? Probably life science, right? A uh, picture like this one right here? Well, you could debate, right? It could be earth science because it's talking about like the geology and how the water carved in that great shape into the Grand Canyon there. Somebody might be really specific being like, oh no, it's life science because there are little people on the water jet ski or boat or whatever that is. Or you could claim all oh, physical science because of the boat that's in there. But probably earth science would be the one that would win this. How about this? Probably physical science. Because again, you're talking about engineering. How is it that you know these planes are staying up and everything like that? Although yes, you could argue earth science, like ocean, skies, clouds, Life science, I clearly see signs of life in here, but probably physical science is going to be the main one for this picture. This one again, I don't know. Is it earth science talking about why is it, what makes these waves happen and everything like that? Or is it life science because, well, there's a living creature right there. Or is it physical science? We could talk in physical science this year about, okay, how is he balancing? The water's pushing up on the surfboard. His gravity is pushing down on the surfboard. He's got to stay just right so he doesn't fall in the water and get eaten by sharks. But eating by sharks, that's back in the life science. And all right, let's move on. Here. Um, so let's move on to the next section right here, right? There are two types of observations that we, we've been making all these observations about the pictures that you've been seeing and everything. There are what are called qualitative observations. And when I do this, I always like to highlight the L, like if you're writing it, maybe circle it or highlight it or something like that. Qualitative observations. They're kind of observations that use qualities, you know, different things that you could describe about objects and everything. They're observations that do not have anything to do with numbers, right? So let's say um, maybe a qualitative observation about this picture in the background right here would be that tropical beach is looking mighty nice. I mean, you know, your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, wherever it is that you're watching this video, it might be nice, but it's probably not as nice as if we could do it right here, all right? Right, so qualitative observation, it's beautiful there. Right, or how about this picture right here? Oh, that, that's kind of scary right there and everything like that, right? But a qualitative observation could be, that squirrel looks mighty hungry. I mean, it, it, it's not looking like it doesn't want the peanut. It looks like it is pretty hungry right there. Uh, the opposite of this, right, are observations that are called quantitative, right? And for this, I always stress the N, like it means it's an observation that uses numbers, right? quantitative numbers are involved in this and everything. So any kind of observation that you make that uses quantitative observations is gonna have a number involved in it. So in this picture right here, um, you could describe this quantitatively. You could say, look, there are two scientists clearly in the picture, right? You could say, look, one, two, three purple gloves. I don't know what happened to the other, maybe it's a one-handed scientist, I don't know, right? Um, those would all be quantitative observations, right? Things that have numbers in it. Um, would be quantitative. So let me show you a couple pictures like we did before and tell me what is a qualitative observation and what is a quantitative observation in each one of these pictures. So for picture number one, there is clearly for qualitative observations, you could say it's like dangerous mouse, right? You could describe it like blue room, you could say white floor, yellow cheese, right? For a quantitative observation, you might say one mouse, one piece of cheese, right? One mouse hole, right? All of those would be quantitative things. Oh, how about this picture? Oh, well, first qualitative. You could just describe it as, oh, you know what I mean? Or I'm glad I'm not there. Or 
that looks like my friend down the street or something like that, right? Those would all be qualitative observations or, you know, my personal favorite would just be like, ooh, or ouch, right? Uh, for quantitative observations, how about this? Like 59 broken bones, maybe, you know, three false teeth in his future, could be, one trip to the ER, I don't know, maybe it, would, it might take more than that, you know, for this. So those would all be quantitative observations. Uh, oh, here, this picture right here, right? Qualitative could just be ouch, right? Quantitative, you could say like one shark or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like 39 teeth or something like that, right? Uh, this picture right here, qualitative, someone's going to get a whooping right now. You know what I mean? Like that's the last time Jimmy's driving the minivan, you know, that could be qualitative. Quantitative could be, well, one expensive bill from the tow truck out here. I mean, that's that's not going to be really good to fix and everything like that, right? Um, so we can move on to the next section, right? What preparation is important if you're carrying out um, some kind of SI or scientific investigation? Well, definitely you want to make sure you have lots and lots of careful planning. You want to make sure that you plan out what you're doing ahead of time. Make sure you have all the materials that you need to do it. In class, we're going to be practicing with this, with practicing SI and doing conducting experiments as safely as we possibly can. Um, and that's one thing you want to make sure is you have the materials you need to get that, you know, to get that experiment done. Um, how can you manipulate an experiment? Well, what we want to do is all the experiments we do, we want them to be what's called controlled experiments. That means everything in the experiment is exactly the same except for just one thing that we're changing, right? So one variable that we're manipulating, we're gonna get into, is gonna be what's called a controlled experiment. So for a variable, right? The variable is whatever's being changed, right? Um, one example for this, right? In science fairs, I've seen this one, right? Um, which battery lasts the longest? Is it Energizer? Is it Duracell? Is it Copper Top? Is it, I don't know, you know, like some uh, brand from Walmart or something like that, right? Which one lasts the longest and everything? What you would do if you were doing that experiment is you'd want to keep everything the same, right? You'd want to have the same machine that you're testing it in all the time. Have the same stopwatch and make sure you're watching consistently. Make sure it's the same, um, you know, the same floor or table that you're doing the experiment on. The only one thing that you would change is the type of battery, right? You wouldn't want to test one type of battery and it's like a little triple A battery. And then the other kind of battery would be like a double A battery. That's just not going to be fair. Right, so the variable, the one thing that you're changing in, in the experiment, everything else you want to keep the same for that. Now, for variables, right, there are two basic kinds, right? There is what's called the manipulated variable. This is the fun one. This is the one that you, as the crazy mad scientist, gets to manipulate. It's often called the independent variable because you're independent. You get to do, you get to make your choices about what's happening inside of an experiment. So let's do an example, right? If you wanted to do an experiment about making the greatest tasting cookie ever, right? Um, to make this cookie, you know, even better than like the best cookie you've ever had, you'd want to pick on just one thing that you would change, just one individual thing, right? So maybe like take whatever your favorite recipe is for a cookie, you know, one that you have from home, one that you get from the internet, one that like your neighbor has or something like that. And you think this cookie is amazing. It's the best cookie I've ever had in my life, but we can make it better. Right. And so what we could do is we could say, OK, we're going to make it better by changing the amount of sugar inside the cookie, because if the recipe says for, you know, making, let's say, five or six cookies, one cup of sugar, well, wouldn't a great hypothesis to be what if we doubled it? If we doubled it, and put two cups of sugar inside the recipe for the cookie, it's going to be twice as good. Let's be honest here. Right. So you might do the experiment. Right. You might go through the whole experiment. Everything stays the same. Right the same, um, you're going to keep the same different spices, butter, milk, whatever it is that's in the cookie, you're going to keep all of that the same. Oops, hold on. You're going to keep all of that exactly the same. But the one thing you're going to change is you're going to make some of the cookies that'll be like normal cookies with the following the recipe, but some of them you're going to double the amount of sugar that are in there and see what happens for that. The other variable that we're going to talk about here is the responding variable, right? Often called the dependent variable. A responding or dependent variable, this is what happens in the experiment, right? What's the result of the experiment and everything like that, right? Does it turn out that your new super improved cookies are twice as good as the old cookies? Or does it turn out that there's a reason there's only one cup of sugar, right? Maybe all that extra sugar crystallizes and your cookie, I mean, it's like, it's hard as a rock. It's like, you know, I, I can't eat it. I broke a tooth, you know, kind of thing and everything. So that would be the responding variable. What happens in the actual experiment when you're doing that? Okay, so. To kind of like um, go through this really quick, right? With variables, 
right? We could give some examples, right? If you were doing an experiment, what factors might affect the taste of soda? So let's say you want to have like a an experiment about soda here and everything. What are some things that you would want to keep the same, right? You would not want to be changing this to make it safe, right? Maybe the temperature of the soda, ice or no ice, the type of cup that it's in. Is it new soda or is it soda that's been sitting around all day, right? Um, you know, soda that's all fresh, right? It's not one like you pop the lid, you shook it up compared to the other ones not shaken up or anything like that. Um, those are all things you'd want to keep the same. How about, uh, let's see if you were doing, oh, what uh, testing out cars, right? Which car is more fuel efficient? Same, uh, similar things. You wouldn't want to change things. Like you wouldn't want to be testing one car and the windows are down and the other car, the windows are up. You wouldn't want to have one car being tested with like 10 people packed inside of it and the other car with just one person in it. You'd want to keep everything as simple and the same as you could for it. Other variables, let's see here. What factors might affect fish, oh, fish population in a lake, right? You want to pick, um, you know, you want to keep everything in the lake the same, right? You wouldn't want to compare two lakes. One lake is like in the sun all the time. The other lake is in the shade all the time. One lake, maybe like people are feeding the fish. The other lake, they're not. Maybe one lake is polluted and the other lake is clean. You know, everything to compare, you'd want to keep the same and everything. Factors that might affect a tomato plant, right? You'd want to keep it all the same. Not one's getting water and then the other one isn't. One's in the light and the other one's in the closet. Everything would want to stay the same as far as variables go, right? So these are all just examples that you could talk about different variables. And remember, all of the answers for these are in the workbook that you have in Schoology, right? So you can always go to there to study it in, um, you know, on Schoology. Okay, controlled experiments, right? Controlled experiments are the type of experiment we always want to do. Like I was saying, only one variable changes at a time, right? So you, a uh, good experiment might be, how hard do Venus flytraps bite? Do you ever see Venus flytrap, right? Do you ever wonder, like, you know, the fly goes in there, it traps the fly and eats it and everything like that. But what if your finger went in there? Or in this case, your whole hand is in there and everything. I mean, would that not go well or something? I don't know, right? So you could, uh, maybe you could do an experiment where you'd have like some kind of little meter that would measure how hard they bite and everything. But it would be a terrible experiment to try to measure how hard and how fast do they bite. That's not a controlled experiment because now you're trying to test two separate things, right? And so if you're doing a series of experiments over and over again, it might get, you know, might get a little bit messy because two things are being tested at the same time and everything. Another thing, how about this classifying? Everybody loves to classify. As human beings, we do this constantly. We like to classify things. We like to put all our socks together. We like to put all the shirts together. We like all the pants that are the same color together um, for it. Um, or how about jelly beans, right? Um, even at, when my children were super little, right, they'd, they'd all like to do this. They put all the orange ones together, all the blue ones together, and all the yellow ones together, and then they'd eat them. You know, rarely did they just want to like work them all down and everything. So we always like to um, classify things as human beings, right? It's pretty normal um, for us to like to do this, and scientists love to classify things. We like to put things in order. Uh, let's hear, let's kind of move on. Oh, the mini variables experiment. I'm going to attach that onto this is, um, it's going to be a little mini experiment at the end of the video here talking about the differences between independent variables and dependent variables. So it's actually where you can see what's going on with it. That'll be another kind of a little mini experiment for you. Uh, and this picture right here. Oh, what could you infer from this picture? Right in class last week, we were talking about the differences between, um, you know, basically taking in observations, taking in information, and then inferring is using it. Right. So an observation would be red car coming out of the plane. Right. That's just straight up a piece of information you got. But inferring means you're using information in your head to kind of figure out what's going on more. Right. So maybe look on top of the car. There's kind of like this thing that kind of looks like a luggage carrier. Maybe that's a parachute right there. So you might infer. Hey, they're just dropping a car, you know, onto some place where there wasn't, maybe it's like an island or something like that, where they want a car, but they couldn't get the car there by driving it or something like that, right? So that would be inferring, make a decision, use some prior information along with the data that you've collected. Okay, another topic, scientific law versus scientific theory is another thing we want to get into, right? Scientific law, right? A scientific law is something that scientists know is going to happen absolutely positively every second every time right no matter what right so for an example one of the most common ones is the law of gravity right we know that if you're here on earth gravity is going to win right it's going to pull us down towards the center of the planet doesn't matter if you're on this side of earth or the other side of earth right doesn't matter if it's night or day it's always always true so they call it a law 
right? It's a big sci it's a big deal for a scientific law to be there. It's got to be something that um, that scientists have studied for literally decades, right? Hundreds of scientists all over the world have studied this in order for it to become, before it becomes an actual scientific law. If there's a scientific theory, right, the important thing for you to get is it's almost a law, right? Some people think like, oh, a scientific theory is just something like I came up with an idea, you know, and, you know, you know, that kind of thing, like, you know, shorts are better than pants or something like that. It's not that at all, right? A scientific theory is something that scientists, again, they've been testing it for decades, for years and years. Hundreds of scientists have been doing it, and pretty much every every scientist agrees, like, yeah, you know, this is true, right? It's just, it, usually what is going on is it hasn't been tested either long enough, or they're just not sure, maybe there's not enough data about what's going on, or sometimes it's just a technological thing. Like, we don't have the technology to actually see something happen or prove it for sure and everything. But basically, a scientific theory, they're like 99% sure this is exactly what's going on, and it's going to be a scientific law. It's only a matter of time and everything for it, right? So um, one example for this could be right uh, plate tectonics. If you remember last year in sixth grade, and again, earth science, right? When you were learning about plate tectonics, you learned about the theory of plate tectonics. You did not learn about the law of plate tectonics, right? Maybe one day, maybe you'll have kids someday and they'll be in school, right? And uh, they'll learn about the law of plate tectonics, right? And you'll be like, oh, I remember when I was a young whippersnapper and it was the theory of plate tectonics, right? But anyway, um, it's the theory of plate tectonics, not the law, only because we don't have the technology to actually send like a camera down into Earth's mantle and actually see what's going on there, right? All that we can do is we can observe the effects of it on the top of, you know, on the surface of Earth. And that's why it's the theory. But scientists are pretty much 99% sure that that's exactly what's going on. A non-example, remember, it's almost a law, right? So something like all dogs are cute, that's not going to be a scientific theory, right? Because, well, yes, some dogs are cute, like this little puppy right here, or moose, right, and everything. It's not necessarily true. I mean, is this dog right here cute? Some people be like, oh yes, it's very cute, right? But how about that dog? Oh, is it, is it cute or, or, or not cute? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Oh, no, that dog's not even cute. That, that, that looks more like a seal and everything like that. Oh, that's definitely not cute. And Oh, oh, okay, okay. Dogs are definitely not all cute, all right? Not, not as nice as moose, right? So that's not a good, oh, and that's that weird thing again, okay. Um, what role is it that models, laws, and theories play in science? Well, they help us understand things, right? They help us learn about the natural world that's around us, right? So whether it's a model or these laws and theories, they're all in place so that it makes things more organized for us. Okay, we're coming down towards the end here, right? There are hypotheses, hypotheses, hypothesis. Well, if you have a hypothesis, right? All that it is, it's just a possible explanation that you think is correct about some kind of problem that's going on in science. That's what it means to hypothesize. And you do this all the time, every day. You hypothesize about which lunch is gonna make you feel better, right? Well, should I exercise or not exercise? Should I go to bed early or should I go to bed late, right? Um, all of that, those are all hypotheses that you're solving with science all the time. That's why you're an amazing scientist, whether you know it or not, right? Basically, a lot of people say a hypothesis is just an informed guess, right? based on what I did in the past, this is what I'm gonna do now, and we'll see if it works out well for you or not, right? Um, so we'll get into, a well, we're gonna do this in class. We're gonna actually have some hypothesizing in class. Okay, data, right? All the data is are the facts that you gain from observations, right? If you remember last week, we were talking about bringing in data and talking about observations. Well, that, you know, each individual observation that you bring in, that is, that's gonna be data right there. So an example could be, there are 92 elements on the periodic table that occur naturally. There are more than that on the periodic table, but only 92 of them can you just naturally go around anywhere on the planet and possibly dig up and everything. The others are all made in laboratories, right? Um, they're not natural or anything like that, right? Data should be something that's, um, you know, that you, can, that you can use in a scientific experiment, right? So it shouldn't be like something that doesn't mean anything to anyone, right? Um, the non-example, shirts are colorful, that doesn't really help anyone. That's not really data. It should be, you know, some kind of useful information for us. And then scientific inquiry, well, that's exactly what we've been talking about for the last, I don't know how many minutes here, right? It's basically the process of discovering things in science, and you do it all the time. In fact, I dare you to try to do something, and you're not using scientific inquiry. It doesn't matter if it's a kayak trip with a crazy shark after you whether you're driving down the road in your family car, whether you're eating lunch, sleeping, you're always using scientific inquiry all the time. 
uh, models, they help us learn, right? Whether it's an airplane model, like in the example here, car model, model of a house, right? They help us learn about what we're going to experience, right? And we can refine our designs before we actually have to go and make a bigger version of it and everything. So models help us learn about the world that's around us, okay? And then again, there are lots and lots of examples. If you go into um, the Science Schoology webpage, well, you've got all these examples right here, right? About how you can learn different things in scientific inquiry. Um, all the answers are right there, right? So if there's new evidence, right, that does not support a scientific theory, scientists are gonna do what? Well, they're gonna change it or modify it, right? Um, they're gonna try to discover some kind of new thing about why it's not working for it. Number two, right, if you give a valid reason why scientists might reject a theory, well, they discover new evidence, new, um, you know, some kind of new evidence comes along that says, oh, that scientific theory that we thought was gonna be a law soon, oh, something happened, maybe a new technology happened that let us see something we didn't know before. Number three, when scientists put things into categories, right? When they're categorizing things, what are they doing? They're classifying things. One possible explanation for an observation, well, that's your hypothesis. Well, your hypothesis, your hypothesis, right? What you're hypothesizing about, that's the whole point of this anyway. What must you be able to do to test a hypothesis? Super important here, or sorry, I said that wrong, didn't I? What, um, in order for it to be a good hypothesis, it's gotta be testable, right? It would not be a good hypothesis if you said, Hmm, you know, there would be world peace. If I could give every person on the entire planet a million dollars right now, that's not a good hypothesis at all because you can't give everyone a million dollars. And if you can, you've been holding out on the rest of us and you should do it right now. Seriously. Okay, anyway, uh, let's see here, a couple more. Uh, the variable in an experiment that you purposely change, right? What's the thing that you manipulate, right? Manipulated variable or often called the independent variable. Number seven, the variable in an experiment that changes, that's the dependent variable, right? That's the thing that responds, right? So you, that dependent or responding variable. Number eight, right? Well-tested explanation, theory, it's almost a law. It's well-tested, right? Don't fall into the trap of thinking, ah, oh, it's just some crackpot idea some scientists came up with over in Australia. No, it's something like people have studied it all over the world for maybe a decade or more and everything for it to be a theory. And then if it's happening every single time, right, that's where it becomes a law. That's like the, the highest level of science right there when you get to that level. Towards the end here, right, um, these are facts and figures gained through observation. That's where you have data. Oops, sorry, that, you know, we'll switch it around here. Data or data is gonna be 11. First though, number 10, right, this is the way of learning, scientific inquiry, right? Okay, number 11, data or data, depending on how you wanna say it. Number 12, how do you start a scientific inquiry process? Find a question, right? We do this constantly. Think of all the questions you have all day long, every day, right? Should I take a drink of water now? Or should I take the drink of water now, right? That starts, that's a question right there. And then the last one of these, an experiment where you only have one variable, that's gonna be controlled, right? Controlled experiment for us, right? Uh, let's see here, last thing. Oh, we, did, we just did this one. Why might a scientist um, reject a scientific theory? New evidence comes up, right? They discover some new thing. Maybe it turns out that the center of Earth is full of pigs and not lava like we, you know, magma like we thought and everything like that, right? Um, oh, here we go. Bacon turns out to be healthy. There we go. That would be the kind of scientific theory that we'd want to have, you know, and, you know that was possible and everything. Um, okay, the very, very end here. Again, we talked about this the first week of school, actually, right? The difference between chemistry and physics, right? Chemistry is basically studying the properties of matter. This is where the video started here and everything. So chemistry would be interested in studying, the, you know, water balloons, right? You know, what's the, what makes up a water balloon? What kind of atoms are inside of there and everything like that? Why, um, you, know, what, you know, what elements are inside of water balloon compared to say a rock or something like that? Whereas if we did physics, physics is more studying matter and energy. Physics is more interested in a water balloon talking about, okay, what happens if you take the water balloon and you throw it at somebody and it smashes against them? You know, what's the water surface tension and the tension of the rubber that's inside the balloon and things like that? That's what physics is gonna be worried about. Okay, um, stick around. Let me show you one last little short video about um, variables where I'm doing a mini experiment that normally we do in class. It's just a really quick one and everything. And then after that, there's a short little quiz for you to take. In this setup, I'm giving you the example for independent variables versus dependent variables. In this little mini experiment, we've got a system of things working together. There's the light, there are two half meter sticks, 
there's a graduated cylinder and a little ball, and we're going to use them together to demonstrate the difference between independent variable and manipulated variable. Remember, the independent variable, also sometimes called the manipulated variable because it's the thing that you, as a crazy mad scientist, get to manipulate, right? And so for this, what we're going to manipulate is the distance of the graduated cylinder from basically the wall, or for, more specifically from the back ruler over here. That is going to be the independent variable, the manipulated variable that we're doing. Now, the dependent variable is the other side of this. The dependent variable, often called the responding variable, that's 